All right. Well, we will get started with some introductions. Welcome to everyone, and thank you so much for making time to join us at lunch today. Um, we hope you're having a, just a minute to uh, take a break during your day, but are grateful that you're spending it with us to talk about educator mental health. Um, we've had a number of conversations in recent weeks and months around um, student mental health and social emotional learning and how to best support our kids. Um, but we've also had conversations recently about continuing to ensure that our adults are, are well cared for. So we appreciate Christy and Katie reaching out to us at MASA to say, hey, do you think people would be interested in this topic and um, to hear what some other school districts are doing? So we appreciate them and we appreciate Jeffrey Lund who is here with us, superintendent from Marshall County Central Schools to talk about how things are working um, in his district. So if you're able to join with your camera on as a presenter, it is so much easier to speak to your faces. Um, if you are unable to do that, we absolutely understand. But with that, I will turn it over to, I think Katie is going to be next up. Yes. Yes. And thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you all for your time. And I concur if you if you can participate. I know you're busy. I know schools are crazy places. So first of all, thank you for being here. Um, if you can be on camera, all the better. It's so helpful for us to, to talk to faces and, and don't, don't worry if you're sipping coffee or um, having lunch. We know this is your, your lunchtime and you're multitasking, so do what you must. But we're just really grateful that you're here. I'm going to be sharing my screen here in just a minute. Um, we do tend to, we do plan to take 15 minutes to go through a presentation that will really go through, um, you know, kind of a little bit about just the, why mental health for educators are important. Talk, a hear a little bit from Jeffrey Lund um, about as superintendent of Marshall County City Schools about their, their experience with educator mental health and how they utilized our program. And then I'm gonna do a little self-care for you. And, and that at that point, I'm really gonna ask you to participate because you are all educators who could use a little boost. So we're gonna do a little bit of exercise and then we're gonna um, end with some Q and A and a call to action. Um, we're really working, I don't know how many of you know it, but May is Mental Health Awareness Month. We have a lot of free tools for your district that we'll be sharing after this for you to promote it. And just really, I think, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of talking about the problem. You know, it's just like, we're so problem focused and we're really taking a call to arms to say as educators and leaders in our community, let's all take action. And if we can do anything, which is to normalize uh, mental health self-care and to reduce the stigma around it that still unfortunately exists, you know, that's what we, that's the step we can take. And we, we've created some free tools to make it really easy for, for districts to do that. So we'll kind of touch on that at the end. So with no further ado, I'm going to share my screen again, if you want to, um, the chat is live. Christy, you want to wave your hand? Christy is um, our director of marketing and she'll be manning the chat. We do want this to be, um, you know, a dynamic and, and two-way conversation. So she has a directive to help us um, be interrupted and make sure that if you have questions or comments that that we're, um, we're attending to them. So as I said, I'm Katie Dorn. I'm the co-founder and I'm the CEO of um, Empower You. Um, today's topic is put the max oxygen mask on first, why prioritizing your mental health and self-care is a key to student success. And I say that because I know you're leaders in your district. And as, I, as leaders, I think it's so easy to have the lens of how are things gonna help everyone else? How's this gonna help my staff? How is this gonna help my students? How's this gonna help my community? You have so much on your plate. And Jeffrey's gonna talk a little bit about the importance of attending to your own mental health. Here's my story. Um, I'm here, I'm one of four. Um, girls that was brought up, brought up in Chicago. I'm the middle child who from a very early age was really um, the one in my family that was the helper. And my, I blame my parents who put me in that position because my older sister here with the shag haircut and the maxi, the midi dress, if you remember the 70s, she was very on point, even played the guitar with a little put your hand in the hand. Um, she was naughty. And so when my parents would go out, they put me in charge and say, 
you know, she thinks she's babysitting, but call if she opens the liquor cabinet. So from a very early age, I was the helper in the family. Um, we grew up and you can see us here and my sister and I were business partners for many years. We started our own business in the twenties. We were best friends and I, and my husband had four biological children and my sister, you can see there, we never found her mate. Um, she did try, um, but she was a force to be reckoned with and that was not gonna stop her from building a family. So you can see the picture on the, the right here. Those are her three adopted children. Ro here is from um, Peru. Um, they were each peppered with really challenging birth stories. Ro was three months old. I'm three months early and was um, born as a preemie at three pounds. And I really believe that if my sister hadn't gone down to Peru um, when she was just a couple of weeks old, she probably would have died. Um, she has fetal alcohol syndrome and some co cognitive disabilities as a, as a grown child and, and a really hard birth story. Lily over here was from Paraguay, is from Paraguay. Um, her birth story is she was in an orphanage for six months and was basically fed sugar water and was very, couldn't walk until two years old and didn't really make eye contact. Lily's now 30 and living in Paris and doing well, but had a lot of trauma to overcome um, from that early attachment. And then Josie here was adopted from Guatemala. And if you believe in trauma for conception, her mom was 13 and raped by a family member, which is unfortunately way too common in Guatemala. Um, so, and, and has really had a journey of some home mental health challenges because of that, her early um, kind of attachment issues. My sister um, adopted them when we were young and right around the time in this picture, she got metastatic breast cancer. And not long after that, she passed away. And um, at that point I was still in business and kind of this, like, talk about a call to arms, life's kind of stopped and grief overtook us. And my husband and I took in her three kids to be part of our four. So this is our family um, here. I, I don't know what, every time I, I, I still get choked up just looking at a picture of those earnest faces and those smiles behind them. There's a lot of, of hard times that, that we faced as a family and a lot of grief we went through. Um, but you can see here, look to the right, they're, they're all grown, our family's growing um, a lot. Four of the seven are now married and my husband and I now have two grands here, you can see. So we persevered um, through some hard times. And here's the thing, you live long enough. And I was just with with 16, if you can believe it, college friends on a two-day hike in Colorado. And everyone has hard. This is our hard. This was our journey. And it was really, really hard. But, you know, when you live long enough, um, or and especially these last three years that have been incredibly hard for everybody, everybody faces some kind of trauma, some kind of hard, some kind of obstacle that makes it difficult to focus and learn and engage in your life. And when I look back at those years that were so overwhelming and we were kind of frozen in space saying, how are we going to make it through? There was really four things that lifted us up. First of all, it was the people. It was the people in our family, not just the ones who showed up at the beginning, because a lot of people show up at the beginning, right? If you've been through something hard, the lasagnas were great and the rides were great. But a year later, two years later, as our family was still struggling, <clears throat> there was people who consistently showed up and they did it regularly, frequently. They did it, they, they checked in, not just on me, but there was other people in our community that lifted us up. And many of them were in the school systems. And I know you guys play these roles. It was a full wrap around. And to this day, I'm incredibly grateful for those teachers who opened their hearts, those helpers who opened those, their hearts to our family and made that transition of three girls who had just lost their second mother to come into a new family and to a new school and to change homes, to open it up and make it um, um, easier for us. Um, and so these really became the, and, 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 and it was not just like, Hey, how are you? But it was really showing up in, in intimate ways. Um, and these, these four pillars here are things we experienced and really are the things that as I reflected on how do we support students and educators became really foundational to the lens through which we created our programs and empower you. After that happened with my sister, I decided it would be a really good time to do a career switch, which is really probably not the best idea when you have, you know, seven children at home, all school age. Um, but my, it just didn't feel like important to sell things the word, world didn't mean, need anymore. So um, I went back to school to become a licensed school counselor and a therapist. And I was super eager and excited to get into schools. But, you know, once you're an entrepreneur and you have that problem solving brain, I had that then too. And I saw that the mental health of our young people 
was really getting in the way of attendance. I was writing a lot of 504 plans um, that were costly and difficult to monitor and often not for anxiety, depression, and ADHD. And that was really our tier two intervention, unfortunately, for a lot of students. And it wasn't helpful. I, I rarely saw a student you know, all of a sudden do better when they had a 504 plan, but that was kind of what we had time to do. We accommodated and fixed a lot of things that really needed skills and support. And more and more students under, in my caseload, I had 400 students on my caseload, were being um, gone through our, our MTSS system and were being identified for referral to special education under OHI for, um, for mental health, um, for ADHD, um, for behaviors. But most importantly, what I saw is that there was more and more students who were discouraged and unengaged. And I wanted to do something about it. I, you know, I had, I, I was 42. I'd gone through this life change. It's like, I want to do something that's going to matter. How can I be part of the solution here? How can we create something that can take a student from here where they're disengaged because of anxiety, where they're struggling with trauma or something at home and they're, they've just, it's coming out in behaviors in school that you know they don't want to, to be acting that way, but there's there's hurt and anger brewing inside that just comes out in un, you know, unsuspecting ways. How do you support those students with the things they need to take them from here to here so that they can be more successful and engaged in schools? So I identified about, there was probably 40 to 50 on my caseload that needed the support, but I was able to attend to 15. And I put them all in a study hall, not the same one, because if you work at a high school or have worked at a high school, you know it's hard and a six or seven period day to get 15 on the same hour. But I, I, I put them into a study hall and asked them to start their study hall with a check-in with support. And this was in the late 2000s. So I was using Google apps, which was brand new at the time, which dates me. But you know, they, it looks a lot like an Empower You lesson does today. It was, um, it was a, a check-in with a calming tool, a little bit of learning about resilience and how to overcome mental health. And most importantly, a reflection piece where the student would take what they learn and apply it to a goal that we had agreed on. And then when we're done with that, they would share it with me through, through Google. And I would go in Google chat and do about five to seven minutes back and forth in chat to support them. I did that for 30 days. And at the end of it, grades were up, attendance were up. These students were, were getting the support. It wasn't sustainable. I didn't have the time. I was working at the big bookends of my day to provide this check-in with support to all the students that needed it. And so I became really passionate about how do we develop something that can really increase the capacity for all students who needed to get the support. So in 2015, I um, formed a, pro a program, a company with two others. We're Minnesota-based and um, we're women-owned. Um, and we're all educators that came from the, um, the field really with a vision to help students and educators increase self-regulation resilience so they can thrive in school and life. And um, like I said, our goal is to improve access, access and outcomes for student and educator mental health and motivation. And we've been in schools in Minnesota since 2018, and now actually we're in 30 states across the country and growing like crazy, as you might understand. We know that there's an urgent need to address student mental health, and you've talked a lot about that, as Laura said at the beginning. Um, it's 57% it's of students are struggling. It's decreasing academic performance. It's increasing truancy and disruptive behaviors. But most importantly, what we have come to know, it's having such a burden and negative impact on educators. And when I say that, I don't just mean the teachers in your building. I don't just mean the principals in your building. I mean you, leaders in your, in your district who have been facing unprecedented stress over the past three years in a divided country, um, in a world that has gone through unprecedented times, right? You've heard that word a lot. And it's taken a toll. Um, I just did a research um, study in some of our, our participating districts to say how student struggles are showing up in the classrooms. And you can see, you know, the, the blue is often and the red is sometimes, and the orange is sometimes lack of focus, disruptive behaviors, ability to self-regulate disengagement, lack of connection, decreased attendance, shutdown, withdrawal. I mean, they're all above 90%. But here's the real thing. I asked that same group of leaders and educators, how is this showing up for you as educators? 95% reported struggling with anxiety and stress. 92% reported difficulty in finding time for self-care. At the end of the day, they were just going home and shutting down with that, whether that meant you know, opening a beer, having one too many glasses of wine or numbing out watching shows or not doing the things to take care of themselves. 
which which parlays into 89% reported struggling with unhealthy habits that they had developed over the past you know three years just in order to cope. And 88% were having difficulty overcoming low mood and, di and disengagement for a job that they previously loved, but were finding it really hard to have motivation around. These are, th 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 this is what you're seeing every day in your schools. And when I talk to different leaders across the country, you know, the great resignation is real. You can't hire enough subs or school nurses or helpers. So your staff is giving up prep periods to sub. And so are you. I know so are you. And it's just, it's exhausting. So it's been apparent and abundantly clear that the place to start is to attend to the needs and mental health of our educators if we have any hope, any hope of really impacting our students. We need to prioritize it because a healthy teacher models resilience, coping, is more engaging with our students, and that comes all back to learning. And you guys know that. That's why you're here today, right? That is why you're here. We know that there is a direct correlation between these five factors and the impact on educator mental health. If they have a lack of control, chaotic changes to the classroom structure or schedule, pressure for student outcomes in difficult circumstances, financial worries, and family stressors. I mean, I don't know if you feel like putting in the chat how many of you think that your educators struggle with three or more of these because over the past few years. If we were in a classroom, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but my guess is it would be a lot of you. We know that a year ago, the Department of Education's number one pr priority was to support students' academic needs by training teachers and support staff and partnering with local community groups. We know that teachers need training and they don't, and when I say training, they don't need just mental health first aid. It's a great program. But when we talk to teachers, they often feel like, great, now I am responsible for the mental health of my students. What about me? We're asking them to do so much. And the lens through which we've developed our program is to really equip educators with the skills, with support they need so they can reconnect with their purpose. They can rediscover a healthy love for teaching when they learn specific strategies to manage overwhelm and reprioritize their self-care. Teachers who know how to find common periods of stress are better able to help their students do the same. And as a school community, when we create a common vocabulary for well-being, it becomes a healthy and supportive place to teach and learn. Close your eyes and imagine a school in which all of your educators are cared for, that they're able to reconnect with their pur purpose, model self calm and have common language to support all students in the building. And what kind of income impact does that have on a school community? And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey Lund. He's the Marshall County um, Central Superintendent Elementary pr Principal. And um, I'm going to let him, you can read his introduction, but um, Jeffrey, why don't you kind of talk a little bit about yourself and then let me know when you want to advance the slide. Hi there. Um, my name is Jeffrey Lund. I'm Superintendent and Elementary Principal at Marshall County Central Schools in Northwest Minnesota. Um, our district's a very small district with 450 students. Um, we're spread across three school buildings, um, which is unique um, um, and, and has some advantages, some disadvantages. Um, overall, we have 38 teachers on our staff. And, you know, Katie really spoke to some of the things that we were facing in our school district. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, stress levels in, in everyone um, were rising. Um, post COVID, especially, um, you know, one of the counselors on staff said that, you know, it isn't that there's so much more added stress now, it's just everybody's stress is here. And then the added stress just boils them over the top where in the past people, people seem to have a better handle on it or, or those levels didn't feel quite as high. Um, but we, we noticed it, uh, you know, some of the things related to absenteeism that, that Katie spoke of, we, we did, you know, have a couple staff members, we started seeing some chronic absenteeism, um, you know, and, and, and you do what you're trained to as an administrator, of course, you talk to them, you, you work potentially on improvement plans, but that's not what they needed, they, they, they needed more self care, they needed, they needed more support, and, and, uh, you know, an opportunity presented itself, and, 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 and we explored it, um, 
I was exposed uh, at first to empower youth through the Minnesota Rural Education Association. Um, I'm currently serving as the North Region Administrator Board Member. Uh, Bob Indahar is our Executive Director, and he arranged for an opportunity for all MREA districts to receive three licenses for Empower U at MRBA's expense. And, and uh, I, I shared that offering with our school staff and um, teachers first, and uh, only had two jump in. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it was you know a big ask to ask teachers to to do some extra things, and this was be something they'd try in the summer. I didn't know enough about it yet to 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 promote it, but uh, with only two of our teachers took part, and then I signed up and used the third third one for for myself. Um, you know, I always thought my mental health was was very strong and healthy. Um, during COVID, I, you know, kind of used, the, I felt like I had some extra time because we, they, you know, we weren't quite as busy. Things were a little more scheduled and controlled. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, as a school leader, you, you do take on the stress of your people and, and that made my stress build. Um, also, um, we, we took on the task, uh, uh, of running a referendum election in 2020 that failed and then ran it again in, in, in 2022 here. And, and when you get close to the end of those election campaigns, um, we lost, we lost by a very close margin in 2020. And, and when we ran it again in, in 2022, we passed by a slim margin. So there was some contention there and people get personal and they complain and, and, and those things were hitting me. Um, like Katie mentioned too, family influence can affect your mental health. Um, my daughter was going through a tough time at that time and, and you keep those things close. You don't share them with a lot of people and, and you're trying to help her manage while you're trying to manage it. It, 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 it does add up and, um, reinforces everything Katie mentioned about family stressors, adding to workplace stress and other stresses. Um, it came at the perfect time. Uh, you know, I, it's a 14 to 16 hour program, but but I found through the trial period that it, it was well worth it. Um, it, it really forces um, participants to, to really self-reflect. That's, you know, we, we as school leaders know the power of reflection, but we don't always take the time to take care of ourselves. I mean, we will tell people on our staffs to do those things, but we're, we're too busy it seems, you know, and, and this, this program really, really forced that. Um, what I found for me was some of the things that I used, used to help my stress was actually hurting me in other ways. And, and the coaching piece really brought that forward. Um, you know, I, uh, one thing I do to cope with some stress is just, you know, you, you get things thrown at you all day long. I, I, I like to do a mind, more mindless activity at night just to let my brain relax. And, and uh, I, I happen to choose um, some sports video games to play. I, 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 when I was a young kid, I always played them um, for fun. Um, as an adult, I learned it's one thing I can do that makes my brain just kind of turn off for a while. I don't have to think. And, and what I found was I was probably spending a little bit too much time just because my stress loads were higher doing that at the end of the evening, staying up maybe a half an hour too late on some nights, which, which takes a toll the next day. So, um, you know, it sounds like a small thing, but, but just changing some of those habits or setting time limits or, 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 um, choosing an alternative replacement activity. Uh, for me, I, I, I started to, to read a little more again, um, and, and was more purposeful with my exercise schedule. And I kind of made a deal with myself. I'd exercise first, um, before I'd ever play a video game. And that that helped me manage that that piece and not stay up so late, be, be more healthy, be more present during the day. I think the biggest gain from the program I found was that professional mental health coach. Um, you know, and in as a superintendent, it, it can be a lonely role. There, there's a lot of workplace things that that you're not allowed to share with people. And, and, you know, even spouses, you know, I was in a unique circumstance. My, my wife teaches right in the same school district as me. And to keep things healthy at home, we don't talk school at, at home very much. And, and so, you know, if there's a stressor going on, I, I would hold on to it too much. And, and the coaching aspect of this, 
I found myself sharing things with the coach, um, you know, about my family or about myself. They're trained mental health professionals. There's confidentiality involved in, in, and, but the feedback they gave was just instrumental to me. And, and so uh, th that trust relationship built over the, the, the time spent with the program. Um, I found the most value in just reinforcing some of the coping strategies that I was starting to come up with. Um, you know, they gave me some quick pointers on maybe some uh, things to just subtly change. Um, and, and overall was a very uh, comfortable experience. Um, and it made it really easy when school started. Um, um, I approached um, Empower Use team and and said, "Hey, you know, we really need to to do this activity for our school staff. How does the program work?" Um, they, they gave me a, a, a run through of, of how to get it set up. They set up a website for our school district where staff could sign on. Um, I I got approval from our staff development committee. Um, to to um, provide this service through staff development dollars to to our teachers. We also actually extended it to our paraprofessionals and office staff as well. We provided a two hundred dollars stipend um, as a team, as a staff development team. We felt that was really really um, necessary. Um, you know, if we're going to ask staff to 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 can convict 14 to 16 hours to a program, we need to, to encourage them to complete it. Um, we know it's for their benefit, but but at the same time, their time's valuable. Um, so we ended up um, having 22 staff members sign up in that first round. Um, and about halfway through that program, it became evident to me that we really made the right choice here. Um, people are coming up to me saying, thank you so much for allowing us to do this activity. Um, it's, it's really helped me. Now, they didn't get personal. They didn't, didn't share what was going on with them, but they just, just were really happy in it, um, that they found something that made them feel better. They, they really, you know, one of the biggest things that they shared overall was that it was, you know, the program's a guide. They were the ones that were really, really making changes to to help themselves and and just the 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 coaching was reinforcing things that they were thinking about and 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 um uh those 22 staff members finished the program um while it was ongoing we had several um staff members that said hey we missed out on the sign up period is this going to be offered again and and so i approached um Katie's team and and said, "Hey, can are we able to run this a second time?" And we set up a uh, second date that's just finishing up now. Um, and we had some more staff sign up. So far, we've had thirty four staff members complete the program, and and you can see by the slide that that uh, Katie's displaying um, the outcomes are 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 very positive in terms of. Um, how empower you help them um, how they were be reaching their own goals um and, and my you know my favorite slide in all this is the last or not slide but is, is the the 96 percent piece of of um feel that it's helping their students and i see it you know we've done some other programs in school we we've, we've got some pbis programs that are blossoming um a couple years back we were trained um in a program called ripple um, that really emphasizes um, uh, the well-being of our students and getting to know them and getting personal and being there for them. This this program fits right alongside of those um, and and reinforces those things. You know, I saw our teachers starting to be more coaches for our students and and take a, take a minute and read read just a couple of the testimonials here from. From our team, I mean, I I heard variations of these statements from just about all of those thirty four teachers. It was a very valuable experience for our team, and and um, I, I will most likely be approaching Katie shortly just to see if if there's you know a, a summer window we can open for some staff that that want that didn't get an opportunity this 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 first year of implementation, or that perhaps. Um, um, maybe need a refresher, they just need it. You know, stress stress in spring has hit them hard again and, and they need something to help them. Thank you so much, Jeff.
are there any questions for Jeff right now before we keep going? Um, I really appreciate your perspective and Jeff's team did the 12 hour program. We do have a shorter program that was co-developed by one of our other district partners um, and checks the box for the requirement for paras and um, community ed workers to have a mental health or behavior PD. Um, and so we, we have all different ways that schools can can bring this to their program, but I love hearing your personal story, Jeff. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, is there a question there, Christy? There's no questions in the chat yet, but please feel free to drop some in if you have any. Jeff's gonna hang around while we go through the rest of the presentation. And then, like I said, we're gonna leave a little time at the end so that you can, can interact with Jeff and hear a little bit more from him or myself in a Q&A, but thank you so much. Um, I thought that we would start kind of, I'm gonna dig into a little self-care right now for you, which might give you a little bit of the flavor of what's involved in our program. So if you're willing and able to, where you are, um, close your eyes. I mean, actually don't close your eyes because you're gonna need to follow along, but get comfortable. And you're gonna, we're gonna do one of our, this is from our elementary course um, for students, but it's called um, square breathing. And I thought we would just take this lunch hour and start with a little tool to help you just breathe, which is such a strategy that we teach to all of our students, pre-K to educator. So if you don't mind following along, you're gonna be making a square either on the table in front of you or on your leg. So we're just gonna take a minute and breathe. So here we go. Hey, Katie, the sound isn't coming through on the video. Oh, it's not? No. Oh, well, that was too bad. All right, I'm going to skip ahead then. I don't know why. That's too bad. Well, hopefully you are breathing with us. Sorry, guys, about that. Thanks for telling me. Um, I'll, I'll try to solve that. And if we sh show another video, let's see. I'm not sure how to do that. So we should have tested that. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna explain a little bit of brain science that will give you an idea of what's behind some of the stress building. As Jeff was talking, there's a lot of stress building for you as educators that you may not even be aware of and the importance of just physics. So I don't know how many of you are previously science teachers, but there is, um, every action has a reaction, which is a basic physics pr um, principle. I was never good at physics, but here's how it works. We all experience the same thing being on this webinar. Or if we are in a, a room, we all may experience walking into the same room. And based on our previous experiences and this lens through which we look at life, that automatically triggers a thought. That thought might be, wow, it's crowded in here. That thought might be like, I don't want to sit next to anyone. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, that thought triggers an emotion like I'm overwhelmed I'm ex or I'm excited to be here. And that emotion triggers an action, which might be if we're in the same room, I'm excited, I'm gonna sit next to anyone because I wanna chat or I'm overwhelmed, I'm gonna sit in a different area of the room. Same experience. And this, this what we call this thought cycle happens so quickly. We're often unaware of it because those thoughts come from our subconscious. If you think about a classroom and people's experience, let's say with math, um, when, a, when a math teacher, my son is a sixth grade math teacher, hands out a test, a student might think, I'm bad at math, I can't do it. And that emotion might be fear, self-doubt, and that action might be to shut down. And it all comes from our subconscious. Our subconscious part of our brain is in our reptilian brain, 
And it's really meant to keep us safe, right? There are thoughts that happen quickly so that we can react um, to keep ourselves safe. And it doesn't necessarily work in concert with our prefrontal cortex, which is our logical thought, thought of our brain. And that's on purpose. Um, right next to our, our, our subconscious is our amygdala, which is our emotion, our heart center of our brain. It, it triggers emotions like big, big, big feelings really quickly. Um, things we like, like joy, but also fear or hurt. And then amygdala is right next to that hippocampus where the where our subconscious is. And we often say amygdala, your amygdala isn't often smart because it can overreact to things. And here's why. It's meant to keep us safe. They work in chorus so that if it's a bear or a fire, and we have a thought, there's a bear, there's a fire, our fear center, our amygdala, sends a signal because we don't have time to use our prefrontal cortex. We just have to run, right? You don't want to be thinking, should I run? Should I not run? A bear's coming. You just need to get the heck out of Dodge. So that is why, you know, that's the part of your brain that works. And as stress builds in our brain and as thoughts, negative inner critic thoughts or emotions build in our brain, um, it can cause, it can build up over time and it can cause us to flip our lid. This is Dan Siegel work, and this is something we teach all ages, age banded, you know, up to educators so to understand what happens when we lose our cool, when we flip our lid, what's happening in our brain. And you can follow along with me if you want. If you make a fist with your hand, it looks a lot like a brain. And your fingertips here are the prefrontal cortex. And if you open it up, your thumb is the amygdala in your subconscious. And when you have, when a student, a parent, a daughter in Jeff's case, or um, um, a coworker loses it, or yourself, right? When you're when you have a big hurt, a big anger, um, a big emotion of sadness that that takes over quickly, your your logical brain literally checks out. Your your brain no longer has access to that logical part of your brain because it's checked out just in that fight or flight mode. And if you've ever said, you've heard a teacher be like, it's impossible to talk to, to them right now um, in this state. When they're aggravated in a flip your lid state, you're right. They can't because access to the prefrontal cortex has been shut off to keep, keep them safe in that fight or flight. And it's really critical for each of us to be aware of this building for ourselves, for our coworkers, for our families, for our students, to learn techniques, to identify before it's happening if you can but how to re-engage your prefrontal contacts and cortex and calm down after so that you can think logically and solve your problems. So a little basic brain science, um, but we're going to start with you. In these really difficult times when there's so much that's been uncontrollable for you and your educators, mental health resilience starts with you. So we're going to walk through a little, a few quick things that will give you kind of a taste of what Empower You delivers, um, but also can be really helpful to you in the here and now, right now. So let's just talk about stress building. This is also physics, right? Um, I think Jeff and I hadn't even talked about this part, but he talked about his counselor saying, it's not that our stress is, it, you know, there's new stressors. It's just that we all are walking around here. I say if our, if our, if our body was a temperature um, thermometer and our, our toes were zero, and our head was 10, we're all walking around like right here at about an eight and a half. So it just takes one more stressor for us to what? Flip our lid. So really part of the physics is to lower our overall stress, to be aware of it first and to lurk, use techniques like Jeff was talking about, small changes in small ways that can just start us here. So when those inevitable stressors come, we have more bandwidth, more resiliency to navigate them with grace. You can't stuff the stressor, stressors away. And if we are in a room, I love this picture. Put in the chat if you know who this is. This is dates me and probably dates some of you. But this is Uncle Fester. And I used from, from the Adams family. And I used his picture because if you stuff these stressors or these difficult things away and you're like, I'm going to power through. I'm a leader. I don't have time for me. I just need to power through. Well, the press, you know, this is, again, I'm not a fix this person, but eventually it's going to blow. And when you, you can't, it is not sustainable for you as a leader, for your staff to just keep powering through. 
what happens when you power through you may think i'm ignoring it i can just muscle through but what jeff talked about happens to educators across the country to, to deal with it, they go home and do a lot of numbing and unhealthy behaviors, which actually make you more tired and not as resilient. This is normal. It's normal, but there is another way. And we're going to talk about another way. I'm not going to show these videos in the essence of time and because you can't hear it, but I will share this later. So if you want to watch these videos on your own, but this video just talks about the first thing you need to do either before flip your lid or right after is regain control of your prefrontal cortex, which means you need to breathe. Exercise quickly, take a walk around the building, do a, an exercise like square breathing, T take a moment and breathe deeply and do gratitude. We teach all different kinds of what we call reactive strategies, but you should have one. We were in a classroom, if you wanna put in the chat, what is your go-to? You should have one. What's your go-to strategy to regroup, to calm, because there was just, and I just read an edu, there was just a, an edutopia yesterday, an article about the research that says clearing your mind, calming your body gives access to your parasympathetic nervous system, which helps, helps you feel better and helps you do better quickly. And most importantly, gives you that access to your logical thinking so you can solve your problem. So that's step one. And I'm just going to go not, not show you um, that video. This video here really just talks about the power of your thoughts. And you need to identify your limiting thoughts. Again, every experience triggers an automatic thought from your subconscious, that fear part of your brain. And many of those thoughts are thoughts of self-doubt that are limiting. I can't do this. I give up. This is too hard. You have them without knowing it. And like Jeff said, he might not even have been aware that he's having limiting thoughts, but it's normal because it's our inner critic, but you can learn to quiet it over time. So identifying your limiting thoughts and recruiting a strong inner coach that can combat those thoughts is a big part of getting out of your way and building resilience. And then reframing your, your, your negative thoughts with a strong inner coach. and. Let me just see if I can show this video, if I can turn on, I don't know, I'll share sound. I'm just gonna try one. Let me see if this one works. So this just talks a little bit about how you can reframe limiting thoughts for yourself, for your parents, for your staff that's complaining, for students, most importantly. Um, Betsy, will you let me know if you can hear it? I'm gonna just try it. Yep. Wouldn't it be nice yep. if you could get rid of your inner yep. critic yep. altogether? Works. Well, it doesn't work that way. Your inner critic will always be there, but you can choose to hone into your inner coach. Think about a persistent negative thought that you currently have. It's a road that is well-traveled as you have set it over and over, creating that well-worn pathway in your brain. Over time, you can create a new, more realistic and helpful pathway by recruiting an inner coach with a growth mindset. This will be difficult at first, but as you challenge your hurtful thought, you'll create that new helpful thought, forming a new realistic subconscious. That just gives you a, a taste, um, but that concept is powerful. We don't just show a video, but we teach and build on pop on uh, with really easy ways to reframe. When someone says, I can't, saying, I can't yet. I can't yet, but I can try. When they're using words like this always happens or never calls on me. The teacher always picks on me or, or never calls on me. You know, using words like maybe. Maybe they'll call on me. What can I do next? When a student says, I give up, replacing that thought with, I can try again with help. But these are all things we can do to reframe. I'm recently, right now, our whole team is going through the educator course and sharing what we're learning as a team. It, hey, I teach this stuff. I develop this stuff. And I have a really strong inner critic. I, I, um, I realize, and I'm really just kind of reconnecting with some of these easy ways to reframe. And it sounds simple, but it's powerful. And then finally, unstuffing it. Don't let it fester. We teach that by, you know, again, these thoughts, these negative experiences, these, these limiting, um, in, you know, thoughts and emotions, if you just put them away, they get bigger and they, they come out in unhealthy, all kinds of unhealthy, like Jeff talked about. 
but we teach four steps to naming your emotions, validating it, accepting it, and refocusing and taking this next step forward with a simple, simple formula as I feel blank because blank, but I can't control is this, but I control this by this. So really breaking it down so it's accessible for you, for your educators, and then they can teach their students these really powerful tools that help them build that resilience and to cope. Because at the end of the day, a 504 plan may be necessary for some, but the life doesn't write you a 504 plan. Learning these resilience skills and how to manage your mental health is the difference between someone who's gonna you know, do well post-secondary and in life and not. And we all need them. Remember above all to have self-empathy and to have unconditional positive regard for you. You are not alone. Build your supports. And as Jeff said, with the Empower You Educator version, there is a one-to-one -one therapeutic coach who can support. It's a safe place to process things, but find people on your team in person and other ways to get support. And check for your controllables and take that next step forward. It's a balanced approach. Don't try to solve the whole problem right now. What's one small thing you can do? Before I get to the takeaways, I just want to lead you with something about what is unconditional positive regard. And if you're willing to close your eyes and go along with me, I'd just like to end before I do a short commercial for Empower You with a gift for you to just an invitation for you to follow along with my voice prompt. So if you get into comfortable positions and put your hands on your, on your legs, palms up, and close your eyes for just a moment and follow the prompts of my voice. Why don't you take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And another deep breath in and then exhale. I want you to think of a person in your life. Could be a grandparent, parent, a sibling, a spouse, a family member, a coworker, a coach who had unconditional positive regard for you. What that means is someone who saw you fully or sees you fully. And in their presence, you feel unconditional acceptance, unconditional love. Despite the things that you don't like in yourself, they see you and accept all of you. Think of that person now. And I want you to, when you think of that person, remember a time when you were in their presence that was unusually warm and positive. Try to recall what it felt like to be in their shining light. When they were shining that warmth and acceptance upon you, what did that feel like? Did you feel relaxed? Did you feel your stress go down? Did you feel your self-doubt diminish? What did it feel like to be in the presence of someone who just shined on you fully? How did it make you feel about yourself? Hold on to that thought for a moment. And I want you now to picture in front of you someone who you're struggling with right now, whether it be a student, coworker, a family member. Picture that person in front of you. I want you to practice shining that unconditional positive regard, that same warmth, that same acceptance onto them despite your own emotions or how hard it might be or how triggering some of their behaviors might be for you. What does it feel like to package that up and give that gift of unconditional positive regard and shine it on someone else? What shifts in you? What shifts in your brain? What shifts in your heart? Now for a moment, I want you to picture looking in a mirror you're looking at yourself. You're seeing yourself fully. The parts of you wish were different. Parts of you that you are proud of, but you're seeing yourself fully. I want you to just practice for a moment, shining that unconditional positive regard on yourself. What does it feel like to just accept yourself, all of you? To have self-empathy and grace with the parts of you that are difficult to accept. I want you to close your eyes and just understand what it feels like 
to shine that same warmth on yourself. What bubbles up? What shifts? Take a deep breath in. And a deep breath out. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. That's unconditional positive regard and action. And that's the cloak in which our team and Empower You walks besides educators, supporting them in their pro this program of self-care and resilience, meeting them where they're at, and teaching them to have unconditional positive regard for themselves. Self-empathy is a big cornerstone of what we teach because it's so important to progress. I wanna move on really quickly here and leave a couple time for questions, but our programs for educators and for students combine curriculum with that one-on-one -on -one support into one accessible solution that builds capacity for districts to support educators, students, and families. We do that by these short online lessons like Jeff was talking about that are acceptable, accessible through our platform that can be supported either by classroom versions or by one-to-one -one therapist who's a remote workforce on our staff that expands your capacity to reach more students like I did way back in my trial when I was a, when I was a school counselor. We now deliver that part in about five to seven minutes of support a day through our portal. And we loop you in in a live dashboard that you can measure impacts and progress monitor, both for students and educators. We know that there's curriculum only in you know, programs out there, but like Jeff talked about, that reflection, that deep reflection, and that integration into your life that fuels change is really the differentiator of Empower You. If you're looking to really do something to jumpstart the educators in your district, that reflection and that integration piece is the, part, the differentiator that really helps educators regain that purpose and that self-care that's contagious to students. It does have a ripple effect. These are some, we just did a deep dive into the data and these are the goals. We are a goal-driven, data-driven program for both educators and for students. And these are the top goals that students and educators alike pick to work on. And you can see the percent of students in, the, in the, each circle that make improvements pre to post, measured improvements. We are a data-driven solution. We have products from our, our family engagement products for pre-K all the way through educator at tier one, two, and three. And the thing that I really like to um, implore basically for you to consider is how are you gonna invest in your educator resilience and self-care? Could it be through one of our five or 12 hour programs for Empower You that you could bring to your educators like Jeff did to his team? I'd also really like you to invite you and your team to join us in a five-day mental health challenge to honor Mental Health Awareness Month in May. Five minutes a day for five days, five steps towards to change. You can scan that QR code to sign up and start the, the first of the five-day challenge right now. You can take a picture of this or in a follow-up email, I guess, Christy, will be inviting you to join us. But really, it's up to us as educators to do something. And it starts with us. We can ask other people to do something we're not willing to do ourselves. And raising awareness and demystifying mental health, well-being, and self-care is something we can all do by modeling it. So this is an invitation for you to join us, to be part of the solution. Five minutes, five days, five steps forward. We all have that. So take a picture of that QR card and join us. You can also join us for a webinar. We have learning sessions every week where you can get a deep dive into what our program's about. And there'll be a chance you can either take a picture of this and sign up or there'll also be a follow-up email. And then there's also, you can just book a meeting to get a demo, which um, is my final slide, I think here. Um, if you wanna book a meeting to get a demo with one of our, our consultants, we have mental health consultants that work with your district to help you fill gaps. Do your educators need support? Do your families need support? Do your students need support? Book a meeting. We do a lot of listening and understanding of the good work you're already doing and understanding where and how we can fit in. I think we're at time and I wanna leave a couple minutes to see if there's any questions. Christy, what bubbled up? There's still no questions in the chat, but it's not too late. Um, feel free to drop one in.
Well, if you don't have any questions, I just want to thank you once again for your time, for your care, for prioritizing this really important subject matter at a time when our world really desperately needs support and solving what is at a crisis level. And we can each do our part. So as a follow-up to this, we'll be sending an email. We'll have an invitation to join our five-day challenge, but it'll also have some free tools for you to just to use on social media with your students and families in your districts to you know, socialize mental um, health awareness month. So please feel free to reshare those and, and spread them in your district. And there'll also be links to attend a webinar to learn more about Empower You. And um, we're just grateful for your time. And thank you so much for being here. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks to Katie and Christy and Jeffrey. No questions because you did such a fabulous job telling us everything we needed to know. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate you and the good.